Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Free Church at Hampstead Garden Suburb as we share together in this short act of evening worship. It will include a celebration of communion, so if you want to participate, please do have to hand that which can represent for you the bread and the wine. But whether you do share or not in the communion, you're very welcome to share with us in the worship itself. We commend our time to God. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we give you our thanks and our praise. We offer you our worship and our sacrifice. We present ourselves to you, just as we are. We come to you knowing that we are welcomed into your presence, not because of anything that is about us, but because of what you have done for us in Jesus. When you see us, you see not us as sinful people, but you see us as sinners covered by the righteousness he has gained for us on the cross. You have put us in right standing with yourself through him. And for that we are eternally grateful. And so we come humbly into your presence, bowing the knee before you, prostrate before you, realising that without that which you have done for us, we could not be here. Nevertheless, we ask, O oh God, that as we find ourselves in your presence, and as we seek to share ourselves with you, and look to you to share yourself with us, we ask your blessing on all that will be shared together. And do this, we pray, for the sake of our Lord Jesus. Amen. And so today is one of those days in the calendar, Valentine's Day. It's a day that's become over-exploited for commercial reasons. Anyone who's paid a visit to a large supermarket during the last month or so could not but notice just how much that commercial exploitation has grown. The number of things that can be bought from a simple card to the most sophisticated bouquet of flowers. Any amount of money can be spent as a way of expressing the love one might have for the person most dear to us. I don't know if you had any cards or any gifts or anything of the sort today. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Does it really matter? But what does matter is that it gives us an opportunity to focus on that which is at the heart of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. The love God expresses for us in Christ is unique. We even had to invent a word, agape, to describe it. But nevertheless, just as that love expressed by God in Christ has its own uniqueness, so in return God expects of us to love, to love our neighbour as ourselves, to realise that no relationship can exist without it being built on a sense of love. But the question comes to be asked, what then is love? How do we understand it, even when we speak of the love which exists between us as human beings? Well, we find that answer to a degree in perhaps what is the most well-known passage in the New Testament, known in shorthand as the hymn to love. Paul's First letter to the Corinthians, chapter 13. I may speak in tongues of men or of angels, but if I have no love, I am a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. I may have the gift of prophecy and the knowledge of every hidden truth. I may have faith enough to move mountains. 
but if I have no love, I am nothing. I may give all I possess to the needy, I may give my body to be burnt, but if I have no love, I gain nothing by it. Love is patient and kind. Love envies no one, is never boastful, never conceited, never rude. Love is never selfish, never quick to take offence. Love keeps no score of wrongs, takes no pleasure in the sins of others, but delights in the truth. There is nothing love cannot face. There is no limit to its faith, its hope, its endurance. Love will come to an end. Prophecies will cease. Tongues of ecstasy will fall silent. Knowledge will vanish. For our knowledge and our prophecy are like our partial, and the partial vanishes when wholeness comes. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, thought like a child, reasoned like a child. But when I grew up, I finished with childish things. At present, we see only puzzling reflections in a mirror, but one day we shall see face to face. My knowledge now is partial, then it will be whole, like God's knowledge of me. There are three things that last forever, faith, hope and love, and the greatest of the three is love. It's important to realise the context in which that chapter is set. The community of believers in Corinth were a difficult bunch. Already, even in its earliest days, they were beginning to divide. Factionalism was present. Personality cults had grown up around the leaders of the church. Apollos and Peter, even Paul himself, much to his disdain. There were arguments within the church over who should do what to ensure that the church could function. There were those clamouring for the better positions, those forced to take more menial roles. The Holy Spirit was active in their midst, manifesting himself in many and various ways. The gifts of the Spirit were spread abroad within the community at Corinth, but in no consistent fashion. They were working against each other rather than on behalf of each other. All of this Paul has to address. He has to find a way of reconciling these apparent differences and divisions before they became so serious they resulted in the breakup of the fellowship. And so he hit on this idea of love. In a sense, he says to them, OK, we're only human, we're different, we have our differences. But that shouldn't stop us getting on with one another. But we can only get on with one another if we learn how to love each other. Because it doesn't matter who we are or what we are, gong or symbol, loud as we might be, if we don't have love. We are nothing. It doesn't matter with what spiritual gifts we are blessed. If we don't have love, we are nothing. However generous we might be in our charitable giving, even to the extent of sacrificing ourselves, if we don't do it out of love, we are nothing. And then he gives us his own particular definition of love. Two words. Love is patience and kind patience kindness be patient with one another be kind to one another the recipe for a stable long-lasting productive relationship at every level patience and kindness Sounds so easy, doesn't it? So obvious. And yet, if we're honest, we all need to be reminded of it. We all need to be patient with each other. That doesn't come easy. 
we all need to show kindness to each other. It doesn't come easy. But if we can find it within us to be patient and kind with and towards one another, we will realize that it will have consequences and they will be for the good. No longer will we envy another person. No longer will we boast over and against another person. No longer will we be proud at the expense of another. No longer will we be rude, insulting to another person. No longer will we be selfish, keeping things to ourselves at the expense of others. No longer will we take offence. Too easy to blame. No longer will we keep a score of wrongs, storing up resentment. No longer will we take pleasure in the sins of others pointing out where others have gone wrong. We will delight only in the truth. If we can discover patience and kindness as the way we express love, then we will find there is nothing it cannot face. There will be no limit to its application. It will survive regardless it will be the most enduring feature of our own collective personalities. That's why it's important. And so Paul is saying to the Corinthian Christians, this is the character you need to develop as you grow up as Christians, as you emerge out of your childishness and become adults. Sometimes, even as adults, we can be childish. The Gospel speaks of us being childlike, but not childish. We need to develop a mature sense of what it means to be a Christian, to love each other, to be patient with each other, and to be kind towards each other. On this Valentine's Day, it's not so much about love for love's sake. It's about a reaffirmation of our willingness to be patient with each other, with everyone. To pledge ourselves to be kind towards each other, to everyone. And in that spirit, we're going to come to share in our communion and not for nothing is the cue for our communion found in that same letter just a couple of chapters earlier in chapter 11 where Paul is taking the Corinthians to task over the way they conduct themselves when they gather together a feature of their worship was if you like a bring and share meal the problem was there were those who brought because they were able to bring substantial things. There were those who were only able to bring a simple offering. The difficulty was those who brought the substantial gift kept it to themselves, denied it to the others and left them simply to enjoy what they had brought. And Paul says this can't be right. And he uses communion as an illustration of how they should be when they are met together and what it means to properly share. Sharing in love. And that is why our communion is a very basic meal. Bread and wine. And whoever we are, whatever our circumstance, however much money we have in the bank, however many letters we have after our name, whatever the title of our profession, it doesn't matter. All of us will have the same. 
from the least to the greatest. Each one shares, as does the other, the beautiful simplicity of communion. The tradition which I handed on to you came to me from the Lord himself, that on the night of his arrest the Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks to God broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in memory of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. As then, so now, we give thanks to God for what we will share together. And we do give you thanks, O God, for your gift of love to the world in Jesus, a unique expression of what it means to love, selfless, self-giving, sacrificial, agape love. We cannot even begin to appreciate what it meant for you to give of your Son in love for us. All we can do is stand in awe before you, humble in your presence, and say a simple thank you. Acknowledging that in that act of giving, you have made it possible for each and every one of us to be received into your presence, into your family, into your kingdom. We thank you for the simplicity of this communion, bread and wine, that which is most basic and yet which is most nourishing. We thank you that each and all alike is welcome here, wherever we might be. You turn none away. We thank you that each one of us is required to be so disciplined that we too should not turn anyone away. We are pleased to share communion with whoever. The gift of your grace for your people. And so it is, O oh God, we ask your blessing on us now as we share. Nourish our bodies, nourish our souls. May we indeed know what it is to be fed by you. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. And after giving thanks to God, he took bread and broke it, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in memory of me. We take hold of that which is for us, the bread, we eat it directly, reminding ourselves of the privilege we have of a personal relationship with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in memory of me. We like to drink together, reminding ourselves that we are all one in Christ Jesus. So please take the hand, the wine, or that which is for you, the wine. We pause for a moment, and as we are ready, we drink together. And we make our prayerful response. Loving God, we commend to you all those whom we love, all those who love us, all those with whom we are in a loving relationship. We thank you for every expression of love, 
which we are privileged to receive from others. We thank you for opportunities whereby we can show love to one another. We thank you for reminding us of what is at the heart of a loving relationship, patience and kindness. We ask you to forgive us because by nature we are more likely to be impatient. We realize that there have been times when we have not been as kind as we ought to have been to particular people in particular situations. And so, O oh God, as we have thought about all of this this evening, remind us anew and afresh of the need to be patient with one another and kind toward each other. And in that spirit, we commend one another to God. And we do this for Jesus' sake. Amen. So thank you for joining with me this evening. We'll be here once again next Sunday at the same time. And you will be very welcome. But until then, may God bless us all.